tales for dark nights. People are suing about everything these days. I remember hearing about that direct marketing company, Monet, getting a class action lawsuit against them because their beauty products were making hair fall out instead of making it look nicer. Kind of a problem when your product does the opposite of what's supposed to happen. But that's just it. Hair care products are one thing. You can just switch to another brand. But let me tell you to be careful. There are some things that, when you buy them, you can't get rid of so easily. I recently got laid off, and being the sort of attention seeker who posts up everything, I let everyone on Facebook know about it. Most of the people who responded were well-wishers. A couple of people offered to get my foot in the door at their company, but most just ignored me. A few days after my post, though, I got a private message from an old high school friend I hadn't seen in years. He said if I needed money quick, I should do direct marketing stuff for Pan Optics. I had heard about them before, a local security company who set up a couple of places in my neighborhood. They were relatively new, cashing in on the whole wireless security craze, but I didn't think there was anything else special about what they did. My friend said he had gotten his system put in a little while ago, and that he was really happy with it, and that the installer was looking for new people to help him take care of some of the demand. I asked how I could call, and he said not to worry. He had the guy's number, he'd tell him to call me and get me a meeting. A few days later, I got the call and the installer, Jimmy, said he'd be happy to come ask me some questions, demonstrate how everything worked, and if it all went well, he'd get me on the payroll by the end of the week. I said that would be great. When could he come by? And he said in a few hours he'd be free, and that was that. Jimmy came to my door in the middle of the afternoon, and he seemed friendly enough. Big smile, strong handshake, sat down in my kitchen, talked about how being secure in your own home was a great thing. He brought out a big folder filled with pamphlets, all talking about the marvels of a wireless security system and the benefits it offered, plus the 24-hour security crew who would contact me if anything was detected. That was their motto, after all. We watch, you sleep. It all looked legitimate enough. With that out of the way, Jimmy started the interview. It wasn't much of one. Pretty much all he needed from me was if I had ever sold stuff before. I had. Did I have a car? I did. And could I be counted on to upsell the top-line stuff to people? I was a little iffy, but I wasn't going to turn down a job offer like this. He seemed very happy when I said I was ready to go, and then he showed me how to install the system for people. Folks, let me tell you, anybody could have installed this thing. It pretty much seemed like a racket to go around and charge people to do it. But when I heard how much the first paycheck would be, even before commission, I was hooked. Just call me Master Installer. Jimmy went to his van and brought in a bunch of boxes of full systems, a lead list, his business card, and told me to get Kraken. Well, he did say it nicer than that, but that was the gist. To test it out before I went and did a bunch of other houses, I pulled out one box and set up a system in my own house. I'd never been too concerned with security, but I will admit it was a snazzy-looking setup. It had a kind of retro 80s feel to it, but the 80s was still kind of cool to remember anyway, so maybe it would make some of my friends jealous. Now that I knew what I was doing, I called a couple of the places on his lead list. Where he got it, I didn't know. That was his own business. And I found a few that would bite. I went in, gave a sales pitch, and bingo, in went the system. It was remarkably easy, and when it was done, a lot of people were really happy with the way it looked and worked. I got four systems done before I began to notice something was a little... odd. First, I called Jimmy's phone number, but I could never get through. It was always a busy signal. Nobody ever has a busy signal anymore, but I tried writing to his email, wondering when I would be getting paid. I did get a response there, saying he'd be sending me a note shortly, but he didn't get into any more detail than that. I got a call a few nights later, and by night, I mean I was woken up at three in the morning. I recognized the number. It was one of the people I had installed for, a guy named Stan who lived alone except for his fairly extensive comic collection. I asked him what he wanted. I tell you, I'll never forget that conversation. Please, help me. Um, I'm not the help desk. You'll have to call the number on your... I'm calling you. There's something in my house. Something. 
not somebody, something. Again, I'm not the... The help desk won't answer. The help desk wouldn't answer. That was odd. Or terrible customer service. Then you should call the police. I'm just the installer. The police won't answer. It's like my phone won't work. You're the only person I can reach. I gulped. What... What can I do? Call the police for me. Call somebody, anybody, please. Where is the person in your house? How did they break in? And then it was what he said next that made me truly scared. It didn't break in. It was already here. It was... It was watching me sleep. That was the last I heard from Stan. Or at least the last of our conversation I heard. As he said that last sentence, there was a terrifying screech, almost a roar, and I heard Stan screaming. The screaming turned into gurgles, then wet, horrible noises, then silence. Then something breathed heavily into the phone, and it hung up. I didn't sleep at all the rest of the night. I don't know why, but despite my new security system, I didn't feel safe. I called the police, who did respond to my relief, and I told them everything I could about Stan. I sat in the kitchen drinking coffee until they called back. I didn't get all the details, but I heard enough. From the sound of it, Stan had been attacked by a wild animal. That was their best guess, anyway, as there was a lot of blood and not much of him left to tell exactly what happened. A wild animal. That was all well and good, except... Somebody hung up that phone. I called Jimmy. No answer as usual. I then called Panoptics directly and asked if they had a special number where I could reach Jimmy. And that was when I got the worst news of all. Panoptics had no idea who Jimmy was. They didn't have installers. They were a do-it-yourself company and did all of their business by internet mail order. If there was no Jimmy... And who the hell did I bring into my home? I went back to Facebook and messaged my friend who had sent Jimmy to me in the first place. I wanted to warn him that Jimmy was a fraud and that he wasn't a real installer. But I got no response. Nothing. I feared the worst. He didn't live that far from me, an apartment building a few cities over. So I drove out there. It was getting on toward night when I got there and I knocked. No answer. I went to the apartment office to get the super who complained a little about the commotion but admitted he hadn't seen much of my friend lately. He opened the door and the stench that came at us was enough to make it clear something was not well in there. The super went to call the cops but even from the door I could see enough. From the hall I had a pretty good view into the living room. A couch sat in front of a TV which was switched on and playing primetime shows and from that light I could see a hand on the floor. Just a hand. Nothing else. The only other thing I noticed in the room was the faint glow of a Panoptics central security tower. The rest of the system appeared to have been smashed into pieces. I stuck around until the cops arrived, though it wasn't until a few days later I got the whole story. What was left of him had been determined to have been dead for at least three weeks. It sounded a lot like the way Stan had been killed. Vicious. Nasty mutilation, possibly by a wild animal. But it was the three weeks that got me. That meant the private message I had received had come after his death. Since then, I've learned a little more about Jimmy, or whatever his real name is. Other people have seen him, recruiting them to help install security systems, using the names of other local companies. He's been all over the country. At least, that's what I hope. Internet chat rooms keep asking questions about him, and pictures they post show the guy who definitely came into my house. Things don't add up. If what everyone says can be believed, he has been in two states simultaneously, recruiting people in the same day while magically moving around the country. It's either that, or he has a bunch of twin brothers. I don't know which would be worse. So if someone you know tries to tell you to do installation work for a security company... Be sure to call the company first. 
If a guy shows up with a friendly smile and a strong handshake, don't just say yes. I don't know how I can prove anything I've said to anybody. The only thing I can say is that I am writing this from a library computer. I can't do it from home. In fact, there's a lot I can't do there. My phone stopped working properly. Anytime I try to call anyone and talk to them about my concerns, my phone sends me to a busy signal. Even when I'm not at home. My computer's internet sometimes won't go to certain sites. I don't dare stay at a friend's house. I don't know if anything will happen to them. All I know is it will know. I don't know what it is. I never see it, but I can sense its presence. I go to sleep, and in the middle of the night I sometimes wake up and know it's there. I know it came with that security system. I cannot get rid of it. I cannot talk about it at home, or else it will do to me what it did to Stan and my old friend. And I've brought it, or things just like it, into the homes of three other people. I sleep. It watches. I bought the winning Mega Millions lottery ticket last week. But it hasn't been announced. And it never will be. And I need to tell you why. I bought it last Thursday from the gas station five minutes from my house. I'm not usually a lottery person, but I figured with the jackpot being as high as it is, why not? It wasn't until I got home that I noticed it. The message. Underneath the Mega Millions logo was a message printed so lightly it was barely visible. Come alone. And below that, at a bit of an angle just as nearly readable, was a set of GPS coordinates. I looked up where those GPS coordinates led, and it was about a three-hour drive from my house, an apparently empty field just past the state line. I did some searching around online, looking for similar instances as this one, people seeing messages on their lottery tickets, but found nothing. I was apprehensive to go, I think with good reason, but I was intrigued. Very much so. I had this piece of paper in my hand, one that had a 1 in almost 260 million chance of being worth upwards of a billion dollars. But not just that. This one also had something more to it. It may sound foolish to you, but the curiosity it had piqued was nigh impossible to ignore. I had off work the next day, and I decided that I was going to drive that three hours. I knew it was a long shot. In fact, long shot is the wrong term. I was driving to somewhere I've never been. A place where there was apparently nothing but grass as far as the eye can see for what was essentially no reason that was known to me. As I drove, the foolishness of the whole endeavor started to weigh on me and I almost considered turning around. I looked at my GPS and realized I was already almost halfway there. So I said fuck it and pressed on. The GPS took me down a long dirt road, but the destination was about a quarter mile into a field of tall grass and corn stalks. I parked the car and trekked the rest of the way on foot. I got as close to the exact latitude and longitudinal points as I could and found myself as I'd imagined, standing in the middle of a big field with a stupid look on my face and feeling even stupider. All I could see in any direction was more grass, trees, a few corn stalks here and there, a blue sky. The crickets chirped, and chirped, and chirped. I stood there for a few minutes, looking around, waiting for something, someone, anyone, anything. But the wind just kept blowing. The crickets kept chirping. I yelled out, Hello? No response. I'm here alone. No response. I was disappointed. I didn't know why, but I was disappointed. I had no idea what I was expecting, but whatever it was, it didn't happen. I took an exasperated breath and resolved to walk back to my car, get in, turn around, 
and drive the three hours back home, thinking that I'd come out here solely to stand in a field for ten minutes. Then I turned around. Standing behind me were four people in suits. Over those suits they wore ankle-length jackets with hoods that completely obscured their faces. They stood shoulder to shoulder, effectively blocking the path from whence I'd come. I just sort of stood there. I had no idea what to expect. This certainly isn't what I was expecting, but... Then again, the entire scenario was strange, so... Perhaps this wasn't all that unusual, considering. Just as I was going to open my mouth to try to speak, one of them beat me to the punch. Do you have the ticket? I reached in my back pocket and retrieved my wallet, took out the ticket, and held it up. The two people on the inside of the line stepped back into the side, extending their arms as if to invite me to walk past, an invitation I hesitantly accepted. I took awkward steps towards them, towards them, towards them, up to them, and started past them. Once I'd passed the cloaked people, they turned around and began to follow me. Every instinct I had told me to run, but each of my legs felt like they weighed a thousand pounds. I kept on the way I'd come, but about halfway back, I was met by two more people in suits and cloaks, who then led me into an area covered in grass that was taller than me. The other four continued to follow closely behind, and it was them I was most unsure of. We walked for about three minutes through the tall grass until we met yet another two people in suits and cloaks standing in a small circular area where the grass had been laid flat. Those two then leaned over, and each moved a sheet of the downed grass to the side, revealing a hatch door. It was then that I found my voice. Where does that go? I asked them even though I felt like I didn't have a choice as to whether or not I'd be finding out regardless. To safety, someone said from behind me. That answer actually put me at relative ease, and I still don't know why. I had no reason to think anything good was going to happen, but that assurance gave me a strange peace of mind. I walked up to the hatch and looked into it. Finding a narrow staircase leading down to a landing with what looked to be an equally narrow hallway to the left. I looked over my shoulder and found the suited people slowly closing in behind me. Not necessarily in a threatening way, so I started heading down the stairs. As I got about halfway down, some lights clicked on, which I was thankful for, as I'd expected to be in the dark once the sunlight was no longer an option. The door to the hatch was closed behind me and the four cloaked people that followed closely behind. Two of the cloaked people squeezed around the sides of me and led the way as we passed a number of doors. We finally reached the end of the hall, and a set of double doors. One of the suited people removed a glove and placed their right hand on a scanner, and I heard a lock unclick. They opened the door and led me in and I was met by a man in a red suit with a white hooded cloak. He looked to me and asked an odd question. Do you feel lucky? I didn't know how to respond, so I just kind of shrugged. How did you feel when you bought the ticket? He asked. Uh, just sort of like I just bought a lottery ticket. I don't know. I was beyond nervous. The ticket you bought is a winner. The winner. Had you cashed it in, you would be wealthy beyond the wildest imagination. So, why am I here? Why am I not cashing it? His crypticness was immediately aggravating. Wait, how do you even know that? The winning numbers haven't even been drawn yet. Do you remember who won the last time there was a substantial jackpot? Or the time before that, the man asked. Well, they're dead. They're missing, I suppose, officially, but... They're dead. Again, I didn't know what to say. An 11-person office pool won this past July in California. 
but the true winner was a woman named Patricia Stevens. They made sure another ticket with the winning numbers was printed so they could take her. Before that, a trust in Ohio was named as the winner. But it was really a small profit organization in Minnesota, which soon shut its doors without reason. About a month before that, a man named Richard Wall in New Jersey was the supposed winner. The person before him that got the same numbers he did was Matthew Paulus, who left his house to go claim his winnings, and was never seen again. Just up and left his wife and newborn daughter, he continued. You were the first one we were able to get before the ticket was cashed and it was too late. And before they replaced you with a new winner. Too late? Wait, hold on, what? I had no idea what was going on. Too late for what? Before they could get to you, he said, as if I was supposed to know who he was talking about. Who? What the fuck are you talking about? I just wanted to know what was happening, and getting these bits and pieces was frustrating. The M-U-S-L, Multi-State Lottery Association. They're doing... things. They're taking the people that have won, the actual winners, and... experimenting. They believe there's something about the human brain, the human mind, consciousness that influences what we call luck. I stared at the man for a moment. That's fucking ridiculous, I blurted out, not meaning to be rude, but it was ridiculous. I'm sure that's how it sounds. Perhaps I can show you. The man's tone changed from one of hurried panic to a calm, relaxed one. He led me through another door, down another hallway, and into what looked to be a hospital room. Only with markedly more computers, none of which were on, and some of which looked like they hadn't been touched in some time. Others yet broken. What is this place down here? I asked. Not just the room we were in, but the entire bunker. This is where we monitor them, he replied. The lottery people? Yes. As well as... he trailed off. This is where we do monitoring of our own... We have reason to believe that the MUSL somehow tracks who is going to win. They somehow guide people, influence them. We... Ow! I cut him off and reflexively grabbed my right elbow after feeling a tiny pinch. I looked behind me and didn't see anything, nor was there any blood. Are you okay? The man asked. Yeah. Sorry. I focused my attention back to him. I have something to show you that may shock you, but I feel it would be best for you to see it nonetheless. I agreed and followed the man out of the hospital-like room and farther down the hall, through another set of double doors and to the right, where he unlocked a door much heavier than the rest had been. We walked into an almost pitch-black room that was near freezing. Watch your step, the man told me. Just as he did, I nearly lost my footing as we took a single step down. Morgue three, lights, he said aloud to no one in particular. And with that, the lights came on, and we were standing before a number of tables, each with the remains of human beings on them, but each also with a human brain, connected to various wires that led to laptops on side tables. In here, too... The computer seemed very dated and worn. It was at this point that I became entirely overwhelmed by fear. Up until then, my experience had been strange, but more confusing than anything. Now, I just saw myself as a test subject for these hooded strangers, whose faces I had yet to see. I couldn't help but imagine them operating on me and taking me apart. It became a surreal nightmare. Before I could say anything, the man finally began explaining things. We have computer experts who are able to access the lottery systems. The numbers chosen are not random, as you've doubtless been led to believe. They are picked carefully, 
and the MUSL targets certain individuals, certain groups, and tracks their behaviors before and during their purchase of the winning tickets and subsequent wins. We believe you have been tracked. And we believe that if you would have waited until the numbers were drawn and later claimed your winnings, that shortly thereafter, you would have been taken by them. We had our people put the message on the ticket just as we have with previous winners, but as I said, you were the first to see it. My obvious question was, why wouldn't you do something other than put a message that no one thinks to look for and no one can really see? But I figured they had their reasons, and besides, I was too frozen in fear to say anything. These pieces here, he said as he walked further into the room, gesturing at the nearby remains. These are what they've left behind. They complete their research and move the victim's possessions and what's left of them into a clandestine storage facility, which we were fortunately able to gain access to. You're lucky we got to you before they did. The man in the red suit and white cloak, hood still over his head, obscuring his face in shadow, stood under the single light in the room and asked if I would join them. I still couldn't say anything, but... I suddenly felt like someone was behind me. I took a quick glance over my shoulder and two more people in black suits and hooded cloaks stood in the hallway, their hands behind their back, standing at attention. I... I began, unsure of what to say. What do you want from me? We need you, the two people behind me said in unison, seemingly a male and a female. Okay. What do you need me for? I asked. We need to know what they know, the man in the red suit said. These discarded remains have been helpful to be sure, but we need to do what they're doing. Get the information they're getting. We want to monitor you as you claim your winnings. And you could perhaps even lead us to where they... They do what they do. They wanted me to be bait, basically. I responded that I wasn't sure, and the change in their mood was palpable. You are in a unique position. You could save lives, the man in the red suit began yelling. You can help the world, and you aren't sure? Just as I was going to try to turn around and make an attempt at an escape, someone else brushed past me, also wearing a black cloak. They approached the man in the red suit and whispered something in his ear, then lowered their head turned around, and exited the way they had come. I noticed that beneath their cloak they were wearing a lab coat. As soon as they had taken their leave, the mood changed yet again, and the feeling was so... odd. Of course, we can't force you to do anything, young man, he said in a calmer tone than he'd even started with. You have your ticket, and you may choose to do with it what you wish. Please, allow us to escort you out. I didn't even have a chance to comprehend what was happening before I found myself being led down the corridors, past the operating room, past the large area, through the door with the palm scanning pad, down the original hallway, and up the stairs. As I exited the bunker, I found that all of the people that I'd seen in there had followed, and then some. Once we were all outside, all of them with their hoods up, faces still hidden, the man in the red suit walked up to me, his head down. If I were you, I would tear up that ticket. Make no mistake, the winning numbers are on it. But what will follow, should you choose to make your claim, isn't worth any amount of money. This, I guarantee. I said nothing in reply and instead turned around and sprinted back to my vehicle. I got in, pulled a quick U-turn, and sped away from there as fast as my car would take me. I looked in my rear view as I sped down the dirt road and saw a giant plume of smoke rising from where the bunker had been. I made it home, still more confused than anything. 
The night they drew the winning numbers, I found that I do indeed possess a winning ticket, and that I had correctly chosen all five numbers, plus the Mega Ball and the Mega Plier. At first, I couldn't believe my eyes and was hesitant to claim my winnings, but then something clicked in me. At the same time, I felt the urge to write this, to let the world know of what is ostensibly going on. But it sounds ridiculous, right? That's because it is. I'm going to be a billionaire, and there's nothing I need to worry about. <laughs> I was born lucky, I suppose. I can feel it running through my veins. It's an odd sensation. I really am just a very lucky person. Right? Have you ever been to Knott's Scary Farm? I went last night. My wife and I stood in line for almost two hours, freezing half to death. After the first hour, once we'd moved up quite a bit from where we'd started, that's when I first noticed the smell. It was awful. It was rotten, rancid like milk that had been left out in the sun for a week, and it struck us every time the wind blew heavily. We got used to it after a while, and we soon thereafter stopped paying any attention to it. We were in line for Paranormal Inc., a haunted attraction set in a hospital. The farther up we moved in line, the louder the sound effects of the haunt and the accompanying screams of guests got. The reviews had all been stellar, and the comments we'd overheard from people leaving the haunt as we waited in line were all very positive, so we were very much looking forward to going through. When we finally reached the front of the line, we were shepherded into another group. Our group of eight was led to a set of hospital doors, and with that, the haunt began. There was an intro a la the haunted mansion, then we started through the hospital doors with the four of the rest of our group in front of us and two behind. The theatrics were impressive, the production value apparent, and the mood was decidedly creepy. It genuinely looked like we were in a rundown hospital. The lights went in and out, and every short while some kind of monster, spirit, or otherwise nefarious ghoul would jump out at us. The people behind my wife and I seemed to be the most scared of the bunch. The teenage boy, and who I assume was his girlfriend, clutched at each other like they were legitimately afraid for their lives. About four minutes into the paranormal ink maze, in an area that was pitch black, the four in front of us somehow went right, when we were directed to go left. That's when everything started. We and the couple behind us went through a door to our left, then walked down a short hallway, and as we did, that smell from outside came back. And it was much, much stronger. We eventually found a door on our right, and when we went through it we found the source of the smell. A morgue. There were two tables with extremely realistic looking corpses on them and countless more bodies and blood strewn about the area. Just then, a man stepped out of the shadows, but it wasn't quick and jolting like a normal scare. This man, dressed half like a doctor and half like a butcher, stepped out of the shadows in the corner, deliberately. He just stood there, for what felt like forever, until he finally shouted, What are you doing in here? and began sprinting towards us, cleaver in hand. We all jumped, and I led the group over a few of the bodies and through a door on the opposite wall. The tone of the haunt had changed. At first, it was lighthearted and creepy, but at that point, it was legitimately scary. Speaking only for myself, at that moment, <laughs> the haunt was great. We went through the next closest door and found ourselves in near pitch black yet again. I was still leading the group, and as I took short steps forward, my shoulders started bumping into things that swung when I hit them, letting me know that whatever they were, they were hanging from the ceilings. The smell was even worse in that room, and a sudden burst of pressurized air made us all scream. We made it to the end of the room, and when I opened the door, the room we'd just gone through flooded with pale yellow light, and I was able to see what was hanging from the ceilings bodies on meat hooks. 
I was really loving the realism of the haunt. The next room had nothing in it, just some boxes. Same with the room after that. We heard some screams coming from elsewhere, but we figured it was just people from other mazes. Though we did question where the other half of our group had gone. We went under a blue tarp and found ourselves back in what seemed to be a normal area, not the small storage rooms we just passed through. Strobe lights led us forward as we moved down the hall. False boards on the walls made way for reaching hands, making the girls shriek. As we reached the apex of an adjoining hallway, something came hobbling out. A woman leaned against the wall, her left leg removed at the knee, blood and sinew falling from the wound. Help me, she said weakly as she reached for us. Please, this isn't part... Her voice trailed off and she fell to the floor. My wife and I pressed on, walking past the one-legged woman and turning towards where she'd come from but the couple behind us were hurriedly led away by two women in bloody nurse uniforms, and I distinctly heard one of them ask, Where are the other two? Kimmy and I rushed down the hallway and through yet another door, this one leading into what looked to be like a recovery room. There were people strapped down to beds, people with missing limbs, people with phenomenally done makeup to look as if their eyes and mouths had been sewn shut, huddled in the corners of the room and prompt dead bodies all around. We went through the room amongst the moans and groans of the actors, and through another tarp, finding ourselves not far behind another group. We caught up to the group in front of us, none of whom were anyone we were with earlier. People began jumping out of corners, from behind doors, hanging down from the ceilings, normal haunted attraction fare. Our new group went into another room. This one had body parts on hooks hanging from the ceilings, flies buzzing around every last one of them. The smell was, again, very prominent. The rotten, old, eye-watering stench. Thick, wet fog permeated the next room, as people in ghostly makeup and attire scared the shit out of us. We went through two more rooms with this group, rooms that were more of your standard haunted house attraction antics. But we soon entered an area set up like a waiting room. The rest of our new group pressed on, but we saw the young man from earlier sitting in one of the chairs, motioning for us to come over to him, and we obliged. He told us that he'd gotten separated from his girlfriend, and that the staff he'd alerted told him to wait there, which seemed odd to my wife and I. The three of us began making our own way through the Paranormal Inc. hospital haunt. We went through a series of tarps, stepping across hallways once we'd gotten down as one normally would, in the areas we presumed staff set up. We eventually found what looked like an operating room, a room we'd passed by completely earlier. The operating table had a dismembered body on it, with flies buzzing all about, and that smell, it was strong in there as it ever was. It was eerily quiet in that room. I remember, like all the noise of the surrounding haunt had been put on mute. That was when we heard the man's girlfriend calling out for him. Alex? Alex! She sounded like she was sobbing. After letting her know we'd heard her, we ran our way through the maze using the sound of her voice as a guide. We finally met her, and she was terrified that the body parts that were hanging up had been real. The dead bodies in the morgue real, all real. She also said that someone had been stalking her as she tried to find her boyfriend. My wife and I were skeptical, of course, but regardless, we wanted to get out of there. Just as we resolved to find the exit, the half-doctor, half-butcher appeared from a corner and began to chase us. We moved down hallways, through doors, under tarps, behind walls, all while this man was right behind us screaming obscenities telling us that we shouldn't have ever been back there. We burst through a tarp, and I was the first to fall. My foot caught something, and I toppled over, with the other three toppling over me. But instead of our screams, we heard the screams of a different group. We'd fallen our way back into the main track of the Paranormal Inc. Hospital, just a few feet from another group. From behind us, we heard rapidly departing footsteps. 
we scrambled to our feet and fell in with the rest of the group. A few more ghoulish actors and jump scares unnerved us further, but we eventually came out on the other side of the haunt. Naturally, we were curious about the things we'd seen inside Paranormal Inc., so we approached a member of the staff and inquired. According to her, there is only one morgue in the maze, and it features a number of animatronic ghouls. There is no recovery room, and certainly no actors with their mouths and eyes made to look as if they'd been sewn shut. She had no explanation for what we'd seen and was a bit brusque in her response. I think Not Scary Farm uses actual people for props in their attractions. And I think we were lucky to make it out. Sarah, wait up! Thomas shouted as he scrambled down the old weathered road. How many times do I have to tell you to go home, Thomas Crenshaw? Sheriff fumed, quickening her pace. You gotta let me explain! She stopped dead in her tracks at this, giving Thomas just enough time to catch up. When he was a few feet behind her, Sarah turned on her heels and looked at him in the eyes for the first time in a week. Explain what, exactly? Why you stood me up Saturday night, or why Mary Radley says she saw you sneaking out of Debbie Altman's window? It was more of an accusation than a question, but that didn't stop Thomas from trying his best. Both. Sarah, I swear to you, it's all a big pile of lies. Mary Radley's just after attention, because no one ever pays her no mind. Sarah seemed to think this over for a moment. She almost wanted to believe him, but no, it couldn't be that easy. Oh, yeah? Where were you then, huh? She challenged him with newfound skepticism. I, my grandpa... Needed help out in the fields, that's all. At sundown. Sarah's hazel eyes narrowed at the half-baked excuse. Yeah. He thought foxes might be getting in the chicken coops. He had me stay up all night trying to catch him in the act. If that's really true, then why didn't you just call to tell me? Sarah asked, the frustration clear in her voice. I tried, but I couldn't get through to you. You know how hard it is to make calls out there. I... I really wish I could believe you, Thomas. Sarah weakened again, the hurt seeping out through the cracks in her resolve. Baby, please. Thomas started taking her hands in his and squeezing them tightly. Just tell me what I gotta do to make things right. I swear I'd do anything for you. Sarah stiffened at the sudden touch, but she didn't pull away. She just stared up at Thomas as if the answers she was looking for were hidden somewhere in those soft brown eyes of his. Anything? Her voice was soft and timid now. The lion had been reduced to a mouse. Thomas smiled that perfect little smile that always got him out of trouble. Anything, baby, you just name it. Sarah pursed her lips and twirled her finger through her fiery red curls as she thought it over. All right. I... I want the hat off this old scarecrow on the old abandoned Dupre farm. Thomas's loving expression quickly turned to a look of confusion. For all the things? You want that dirty old scarecrow hat? No one's ever done it before, and you know what people say about that place. If you can get it to me, that hat, it'll show me how devoted you are to me. Every kid in town will be talking about it. Of course I can get it. It's just a scarecrow. Maybe, maybe not, Sarah muttered. Thomas tilted his head at her curiously. I believe in all that hocus-pocus. Sarah crossed her arms in a huff reminding Thomas why the request was being made in the first place. Never you mind what I do or don't believe, Thomas. You just worry about getting me that hat. All right, all right, I'm sorry. Just bring it to school tomorrow and give it to me at lunch in front of everyone, Sarah exclaimed. That'll put an end to all this Debbie Altman talk. 
Dad explained it, all loud and clear. Sarah didn't really care about the hat or the scarecrow. She just wanted all the gossip to stop. And if there was anything that could make that happen, it'd be someone getting their hands on that damn hat. All right, baby. I'll get it done. I love you, you know. I gotta get home, Thomas. I'll see you around. Was all he got in response as Sarah left him alone on the empty old stretch of road. He sighed and started his walk off to the Dupre farm. Guilt welled up like a knot in his stomach. The truth was he had indeed been unfaithful. He still loved Sarah, at least he thought he did, but he was eager and hormonal. And like many boys his age, he had needs and urges. Sarah wanted to do the proper Christian thing and wait. Something Thomas had agreed with at first. But as time went on, he found this arrangement increasingly frustrating. Then Debbie came along. Sweet, easy Debbie. She made everything so much better for her time. It was never serious. They both understood that perfectly. They'd sneak off and have their fun, and with his needs satisfied, Thomas was a much more agreeable boyfriend to Sarah. It went on like that for a month. Thomas was happy, Debbie was happy, and Sarah was happy too. That is, of course, until she, along with the entire school, found out what Thomas was doing. Now everything was so messy, and Thomas was beginning to realize what a mistake it had all been. He continued to think that fact over as he made his way to the old farm. It was a way he knew very well, actually. His grandfather's land was right next to the Dupre's. Thomas could remember spending many restless nights staring out of his bedroom window, wondering if that old scarecrow out there was watching him. But he wasn't a child anymore. Now he saw that scarecrow for what it was, straw and cloth and dust, nothing more. As Thomas finally made it to the small wooden fence that separated his family's land from the Dupre's, he found himself more worried about the possibility of a snake bite rather than any old scarecrow. The Dupre's land was truly an eyesore, an unruly jungle of grass and weeds sprung up from every inch of the property, the worst of it stretching to two feet in height. Thomas didn't want to think about all the different types of nasty critters that could be waiting in their form. He reminded himself that he was doing this for Sarah, and with a big gulp of courage, he started to climb over the fence. Unfortunately... He only managed to get one foot onto the property before a strong, leathery hand grabbed him by the collar of his shirt with a rough, crackling voice ringing out from behind him. Thomas! The grandfather's boy shouted loudly, nearly sending Thomas jumping out of his own skin. What in the hell do you think you're doing, boy? The old man scolded as he pulled his grandson back over the fence. Thomas tried to fight, but despite his age, the old farmer was much stronger than he. He wriggled in vain as his grandfather dragged him into the house. Once inside, Thomas was finally freed from his grandfather's grip. I've told you time and time again to stay away from that land. How many more times do you need to tell them before they start listening? God dang it, I ain't a child no more. Thomas began shouting before his grandfather's hard stare shut him up. Then you ought to stop acting like one and don't you ever take the Lord's name in vain. Thomas mumbled out an apology as he stared at the floor, unable to meet his grandfather's oppressive gaze. What were you trying to get over the fence? What's the matter? Thomas huffed. Boy, you better answer my question. The old man said coldly. Thomas knew that tone and he knew better than to give any lip when his grandfather used it. I was going to try to get the Scarecrow's hat. He admitted, finally meeting his grandfather's eyes. To Thomas's surprise, that cold stare turned to an expression he'd never seen before. It was a solemn look with tinges of fear and something more, something deeper. The old man kept buried inside. Grandpa? I was praying he wouldn't say that, but I knew it was coming. The old man answered in a defeated voice. Sit down, boy. Let's have a talk. Thomas followed his grandfather to the wooden table where they ate all their meals. 
and once they both sat down, his grandfather spoke again. Why do you want that hat, Thomas? There was no anger in his voice now, just concern. I, uh, I messed things up real bad with Sarah, and she said giving her that hat, that's the only way I could make it right. Thomas was surprised by his own honesty. He hadn't wanted to tell his grandfather any of it, but it just seemed to spill out. Thomas's grandfather sighed and began rubbing his temples. I know how much you like that girl, Thomas, but you can't do that. I have to. Go talk to Sarah tomorrow. Find another way to make things right. I won't let you do that. I can't let you do that. Why not? Why is everyone in this town so damn terrified of that dumb old scarecrow? Thomas's voice peaked in frustration. Boy, how much do you know about that old farm? Just stupid bedtime stories to scare little kids. Sarah's mom told her one night that the scarecrow jumped off his post and gobbled up the Dupree's in their sleep and that he'll do the same to any children who don't mind their elders, Thomas scoffed. So you never did learn the real history of that place and that damn thing. That's my fault. I should have told you about it a long time ago. I guess I just didn't want to acknowledge it myself. Thomas stared at his grandfather quizzically. The promise of an explanation managed to lessen his rising temper. It all started with Virgil and Adeline Dupre. They were a Haitian couple that moved here from Louisiana. From what people say, they were kind, hard-working people. It was a different time, though, back when people didn't really take kindly to seeing colored folk owning land, let alone seeing them prosper because of it. That bitterness and disgust just festered and slowly turned to rage and hate until, eventually, something evil happened. One night, the townspeople came in their white hoods with their torches and their clubs. They dragged Virgil Dupree out of his home and they tortured him. Then they hung him from the oak tree beside his house. Edeline had been visiting family in Louisiana at the time, and when she came back, the only thing waiting for her was her husband's remains swinging from a branch. They never convicted anyone. The police turned their back on it all, and Edeline was inconsolable. Thomas's grandfather explained regretfully. The grief, anger, and fear ate all the way at her, until she just couldn't take it anymore. If the law wouldn't bring her justice, she'd get it another way. Unbeknownst to the rest of the town, Adeline Dupree practiced voodoo, and in her grief and rage, she started making that scarecrow. They say she stuffed it with talismans and mystical herbs, wrapped it in a cloth dipped in strange potions, and even made it a costume out of different scraps of Virgil's clothes. And once it was finished, she put it on a post in front of the house. She cut the throats of every last bit of livestock she owned at that scarecrow's feet, and with all that hatred and suffering and blood, they say she put a demon in that scarecrow. Now, when word got around that Hedlin Dupre had been out there sacrificing animals and singing in a strange foreign language, people were up in arms. They swarmed the farm, planning to lynch Edelin just like her husband. They never laid a finger on her, though. They say that scarecrow sprung from its post and tore every last one of them up like an animal. Then it impaled their bodies on the branches of the oak tree Virgil was hanging by, all while Edelin sat on her porch and watched. The people that remained in the town never bothered Edelin after that. She stayed in that house, mad and alone, until she finally drank herself to death. The bank sold the land many times over, but all the owners either died or fled soon after. Eventually, people stopped buying and the land was abandoned. Thomas stared at his grandfather wide-eyed and slack-chawed. You really believe that load of horse shit? Thomas was flabbergasted. This was just absurd. Voodoo magic? The killer scarecrow? He felt like the only sane person in the town of gullible, superstitious fools. His grandfather just sighed and shook his head before continuing. I know. I thought it was nonsense when I was your age, too. 
Then one night I tried to steal that hat myself. Thomas's ears perked at this. What happened? The old man stared down at his clasped hands and took a shaky breath. I didn't ever want to have to tell anyone this story, especially you. But I can see it's something you're going to need to hear. It was me and three other people. The whole thing had been Peter Barnett's idea. He'd always been a troublemaker despite being the son of our high school principal. Peter's younger brother, Andy, tagged along wherever Peter went. There was also Carol Ann Dietz, a girl I was sweet on at the time. A faint smile spread across the old man's wrinkled lips as he remembered the girl from so long ago. I was really only going to impress her. We were all going to be the first kids in town to nab the scarecrow's hat. Uh, that's what we thought, at least. It was dark out when we all hopped the fence and started walking. Everything was normal for a while. Peter and Andy were walking ahead while I stayed in the back with Carol Ann. We were talking about school, joking with each other. And Carol Ann noticed something odd. It was quiet, dead quiet out there. No crickets, no toads, no nothing. And in a place as overgrown as the Dupree's land, it just didn't add up. It spooked Andy something fierce, but we all just tried to forget it. Eventually, after a good deal of walking and complaining, mostly on Andy's part, we made it to the Scarecrow's post. Thomas watched as his grandfather's eyes turned glassy, and his voice grew quiet and fearful as he continued... It was so unsettling up close. The thing was dressed in a moldy, dark green shirt, ragged, dirty blue pants, and a tattered maroon shoulder cape. The get-up looked like it belonged more on some New Orleans voodoo man than a scarecrow. It had such an unnaturally long and thin body, and its head, the thing's head was a pale, ghostly white stuffed sack tied tight with rope that coiled around its inhumanely long neck. It had long, dirty straw for hair. The only facial features the thing had was a long, stitched smile and another set of stitches higher up on the head that almost looked like a single shut eye. And on top of that damn hat. It was large, a wide-brimmed hat that was the same maroon color as the cape with two big black feathers sticking out of the side. The worst thing about it, though, was the way it was posed. The post was shaped like a large cross. The scarecrow's arms were tied to it by barbed wire. His head was resting on its shoulder like some sick mockery of the crucifixion. We all just stood and stared in awe and disgust at the thing, until Peter finally piped up and snapped us all out of it. The post was so tall that none of us could reach the hat on our own, so Peter had Andy climb on his shoulders to reach it while me and Carol Ann watched. That was fine by me. I didn't want to get any closer to that thing. I was just glad we were going to get the hat and get out of there. But just as Andy was about to reach it, he let out a terrible shriek and fell off his brother's shoulders flat onto the ground, we all started cussing him out for scaring the life out of us when he started shivering and pointing at the scarecrow. And that's when we all saw it. The thing was staring at us with a big, bloody red eye. The damn thing had an eye. It lifted its head off its shoulder with an awful cracking noise and just stared down at us with that single piercing red eye. Then it opened its mouth with a wet tearing noise and took the shrillest, most bone-chilling breath of air I've ever heard in my life. It was as if this thing hadn't used its lungs in decades. The thing started to jitter and writhe on that post until two hands burst out of its sleeves. The thing didn't have human hands. They looked more, more like giant crow's feet. I can still remember the way it wriggled, those three sharp clawed fingers, once it sprouted those hands, its back started to throb and pulse like its arms. Then a pair of big, feathery black wings burst out of the thing's back. None of us moved a muscle the entire time. 
You may think us stupid for not bolting the moment that thing started to move, but understand this. Until you've seen what I have, you'll never understand what that kind of terror does to your body. We were all paralyzed, and as much as our minds screamed for us to run, our legs was... they just wouldn't listen. All we could do was watch like the helpless things we were. As the barbed wire started to unravel and the monster dropped from its post, its body making more of those sickening cracks and pops as it stood, Andy managed to let out one more shriek that somehow freed us from our paralysis. The thing wrapped a large, clawed hand around the boy's head and leapt into the air, carrying Andy up with it. We were all in hysterics, Peter especially. He was screaming and crying, calling out Andy's name and begging for him back. Caroline was just mumbling to herself with this foggy look on her face, and all I can remember was screaming at the top of my lungs that we had to run. Eventually, the two of them realized I was right, so we ran as fast as we could. We didn't make it far before Andy's body fell from the sky in front of us. Every bone in his body looked broken, and there was just so much blood. Peter started throwing up then, and while he was doubled over, that thing just swooped down and landed right on him. I didn't stay to watch what happened to him. I just grabbed Carol Ann's arm, and we kept on running. We were so close I could just make out the wooden fence when Carol Ann's hand was yanked away from mine. I turned just in time to watch that monster drag her away. A pang of grief stabbed at the old farmer. His voice grew full of shame and regret as he forced himself to keep talking. For a moment, I thought about going back for her, trying to fight that thing and save Carol Ann, but I knew that was suicide. No, I did the less noble thing. I kept on running until I hit that fence. I remember climbing over it and landing on my hands and knees on the other side. And when I turned around, there was the thing, perched on the fence, like a gargoyle. I was sure this was it. The monster was going to rip me apart. But it didn't. It just sat there on the fence, staring at me with this single, bulging, hate-filled eye. Then it darted back towards the property. I managed to get to my feet just in time to watch it return to the fence with Carol Ann. She was alive. Both her legs were broken. It dropped her a few feet away from the fence and just stared at me. She tried to crawl, but the thing just pulled her back if she got too far. She was sobbing and begging me to help her. I took a single step towards her, but then I saw the eagerness in that monster's eye. I understood what it was doing. It was trying to lure me back onto the property because it couldn't leave. I told Caroline I was sorry. Then I started stepping back. Once it knew I wasn't taking the bait, the scarecrow let out a wail like I've never heard before. It pounced on poor Carol Ann. It snapped both of her arms like twigs, and once she couldn't defend herself, it tore into her with those talons. I watched helplessly while that monster tore the flesh off her beautiful face, then plucked out her eyes. She was alive for all of it. She was screaming my name and begging more to help her. Then it took her tongue and she was quiet. Once she was gone, I watched it drag her body back towards the farmhouse. Tears welled in the old man's tired eyes. He stifled a sniffle as he wiped them away before finishing. The police found all three of their bodies impaled on the dead oak tree the next morning. I was so scared they'd pin it all on me. But there was never an investigation. People knew what happened. And like they had so many times before, they turned a blind eye to it. You can believe whatever you want, boy. But I know what I saw on the Dupre farm that night. What I've told you... is the Lord's truth. And it's why you're forbidden from ever setting foot on that property. Thomas sat quietly trying to process his grandfather's words. 
His head raced and his skeptical resolve started to waver, but only for a moment. It was quite the tale, but that's all it was, just a tale, meant to scare a child into behaving. Thomas wasn't a child and he saw through his grandfather's tricks, even if he still didn't know the reasons for it. He assured his grandfather that he understood and would never set foot on the property again. Under the cover of night while his grandfather slept, Thomas snuck out and crossed the fence onto the abandoned land. He made his way to the old farmhouse where the scarecrow waited. To Thomas's unease, the thing was just how his grandfather had described, right down to that unsettling pose. His grandfather had gotten a lot of things right, in fact, like the dead silence of the area. Thomas shook away the paranoid thoughts. There was a simple explanation for it all. His grandpa had indeed been on the farm, but he just chickened out. That was it. Satisfied with that explanation, Thomas began climbing the wooden post like a tree. The hat was nearly in his grasp when he saw it. A single red, veiny eye with a pale, milky iris staring down at him. He fell from the post with a terrified scream. As he lay there on the ground, coughing and trying to catch his breath, he realized just how wrong he'd been as the scarecrow's mouth, his stitched mouth, tore open into a large, nightmarish grin. I've never been a religious person, and I'm still not. But what I experienced definitely made me believe in something. I recently had a near-death experience. I was in a car accident eight months ago, T-boned by a drunk driver. My car was hit on the passenger side, sending my car rolling seven times before stopping on the sidewalk outside some big business building. Miraculously, I didn't break any bones in the crash, continuing my streak of having never broken a bone despite a life spent doing admittedly dangerous activities. I played football from 6th grade to 12th, and during 7th grade I began practicing jujitsu and kung fu, which I'd continued into adulthood. I'm also an experienced rock climber, and I've always been partial to motorcycles. I don't say all this to sound cool or give off the impression that I'm some kind of badass, but to illustrate how... lucky I've been to have spent my life doing those sorts of things and never broken a bone... I laid on the operating table with swelling in my brain and internal bleeding, and at one point, I flatlined. What I experienced when that happened is why I'm writing this, as a warning to everyone. I didn't know if there was anything after death, let alone a heaven or hell, so... When I opened my eyes and found myself in a cave, I was very confused... Everything had a kind of eggshell white tone to it, from the ground to the rocky walls and the stalactite-filled ceiling. And it was freezing. I could see my shaky breath making clouds as I tried to get a grip on what was happening. But before I was able to, the most terrifying things I had ever seen turned a corner and approached me. Skeletons. Actual, moving, living skeletons, inexplicably held together in their humanoid form, stormed in and grabbed me by my arms. I kicked and screamed as they dragged me down the hall until we entered an absolutely huge space. A sort of throne room, from what I could see. Everything was made of bones. There was a giant throne made entirely of hard, white bones. Chandeliers of Oshin rock, handrails and footpaths, doors and tables and chairs. All made entirely of bones. Collagen and calcium stalactites hung from the ceiling like spears. Stalagmites jutting out of the floor like spikes. But the strangest things were the ornate monuments... The room was as magnificent as any I'd ever seen in its own way, with multiple waterfalls and fountains and a cascading wall. 
In every case, however, it wasn't water coming out of them. It looked like... milk. There were banners hanging all over the place, all of them with the visage of a common cow. I looked to my right and saw the room that looked like a chapel, with bone people bowing before an altar upon which was a bone carving of a cow. Statues of heifers lined the walkway leading up to the throne, and it seemed to me that the bovine was worshipped as a sort of deity by the inhabitants of the place. I was taken to a chair in front of the massive throne of bones and sat there for what oh, felt like an eternity. The music started. Drums started banging, and all at once the bone people present in the room, at least fifty if I had to guess, most of them with cups of that same white liquid in hand, started humming. A group lined up on either side of the throne, despite having no visible lips or lungs, managed to blow into trumpets. The fanfare sounded, and I knew something important was about to happen. From a long tunnel to my left, I heard marching steps growing louder and louder. Several tense moments later, a number of what appeared to be guards emerged from around a corner, holding bone staffs with bone sword slung across their backs and bone helmets placed redundantly upon their heads. They were escorting someone, some thing, and led them to the throne. The person of honor stood before the throne, adorned with a magnificent bone crown, and raised his skeletal hands in the air. Silence! His voice boomed. Quizzically, I looked around the room, awestruck by his ability to speak without vocal cords. No one had really been making any noise to begin with. At his word, everyone dropped to their knees in reverent fealty. Welcome, the skeletal monarch said to me, to my kingdom. Cheers erupted from all around me. Silence! The Bone King screamed once again and the room fell quiet as his followers dropped to their knees a second time, bowing their heads. I see you have met some of your fellow soldiers. I... Uh, what is this? I asked, a little more brusquely than I'd intended. Well, this is your new home. That is, until we are adequately prepared, he replied. Prepared for what? Who are you? I asked. Oh, I am the ruler and commander of the skeletal army, he roared. Eliciting another round of raucous applause before screaming yet again, Silence! He regained his composure. But you may call me Mr. Skeletal. Oh, okay, I replied nervously. And why am I here? Isn't it obvious? You are a powerful ally. A gifted individual. You! A one of the strong boned ones. Your time living was spent doing all manner of dangerous activities. Never once did a bone of yours snap. Unlike the weaklings that overpopulate that deplorable wasteland of an overworld now. Another eruption of cheers. Another call for silence. Another bowing of heads. Pathetic mortals who rely on slings and casts and metal rods and screws. It makes me sick. But you... You've courageously dedicated your life to the completion of the most injurious of activities. And yet your bones prevail. You are a monument to calcium itself, my boy. An inspiration to our hallowed ranks. If I didn't know better, I'd swear it was milk itself, rather than blood, which runs in your veins. I had no idea what to say, but I knew then that what I'd seen earlier had indeed been fountains of milk. You have been chosen. 
as you are one of the strongest of your kind. Make no mistake, you will be now common foot soldier, you my most incomparable subject. You are destined for far greater things. Chosen. For what? I asked, still unbelievably confused. Why, the uprising, of course, Mr. Skeletal said. Where you come from, the land of the living, overrun by fragile, weak-boned meat sacks, that realm is rightfully mine. There exists a hierarchy, and I trust I needn't explain why those of us who have never broken a bone are superior to those brittle weaklings. We are strong. He thumped defiantly upon his rigid sternum. As if on cue, the bony masses cried out in approval again. Once more they were hushed by their king, and in blind devotion, they threw themselves to the ground. Those in this chamber, they were once like you, but they too passed and were sent here, he explained. They lived lives in the overworld and transitioned to the other side, having never broken a bone. And I commend them for that, of course. Yet, most of them lived soft, cushy lives, never engaging in those activities that would test the true strength of their bones. You, my boy, your bones are truly strong. You have proven their unique strength time and again. This is why you are valuable to me. So, I stammered, bewildered, doing my best to piece everything together. I'm supposed to become a skeleton soldier and help you conquer the world? I have faith that you will become a great skeletal general, the king replied. You will stand by my side, and together we shall take control of the overrealm from the weak-boned mortals. As one, we shall break their arms, and legs, and wrists, and ankles, and fingers, and toes, and necks, and backs. We shall drown them in milk and marrow, and settle for nothing less than the destruction of their very souls. Once my army is prepared, we will cross over, and the war shall begin. At that moment, I realized that my sister, mother, and grandparents had all broken at least one bone in their lives. If I went along with what had been planned and played my part, I would be sentencing my loved ones to death, or worse. At the same time, I recognized that great value was being placed in me, so... In spite of what should have been obvious horror and confusion, I responded with mock assuredness. No, I said. I refuse. The rooms instantly burst into a cacophony of angry screams and jeers, and these Mr. Skeletal did not put a halt to. You dare disobey the Skeletal King, he shouted at me. I didn't know what to say. I knew I could never join his ranks if it meant murdering everyone I'd ever known. You are a disgrace, he growled, frothing with rage. You have in you a great strength, and you choose to side with the feeble? The infirm? He took a few steps down from the platform his bone throne sat on. I will give you... One more chance, he said. And I implore you to reconsider, lest you share the fate of the insolent, traitorous worms that came before you. And what fate would that be? I inquired, more afraid at that very moment than I'd ever been. You will be sent back to your pathetic overworld, to reunite with your frail, inferior friends, your unremarkable bloodline. Upon your return, you will find yourself stripped of the power you now hold in your bones. 
and you will live the rest of your full life cursed. Doomed to wait out a pitiful existence in a pathetic mortal body. Forever in need of more calcium. The room had gone eerily silent and not at Mr. Skeletal's command. The tension in the air was palpable, with all the bone people and the Skeletal King himself awaiting my response. In or out? Mr. Skeletal sent through closed teeth, seething with anger. I considered the consequences, weighing them against what awaited me if I accepted the offer and chose to stay. I would either return to my life on Earth, albeit with increased odds of breaking a bone or two someday, or else remain a citizen of the Bone Kingdom, conscripted as a high-ranking official in an army that would one day soon launch an attack on everything I'd held dear. Out, I said. Before I even got the word out, the room exploded into a deafening din of torturous shrieks and disapproving slurs. Somewhere in the distance, the unmistakable doot 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 of trumpets sounded, their cheerful tones and haunting contrast to the otherwise ominous atmosphere. A moment later, two guards seized me by my arms, holding me in place. Fool, Mr. Skeletal said, an odd mixture of disdain and disappointment evident in his thunderous voice. You may have strong bones, but you're as stupid as your easily broken brethren. You could have had it all. You could have been a general in the most powerful army your miserable world will ever see. But no more. I will send you back. Because, like the bones of our army, my words are unbreakable. But make no mistake. Where once you were as steel, you will now be as the hollow reed where once you would have had the opportunity to lead an unstoppable force in our rightful taking of the overworld. You will now be our first target. With a wave of the remains of his hand, he turned away from me in disgust and cried out, Get him and his weak bones out of my sight! His soldiers obeyed without hesitation. Nearby trumpets bellowed again. I was dragged back to the room in which I was initially awakened. There, they beat me, systematically. First, they targeted my arms with clubs, beginning with my hands, then my wrists and forearms. They then moved onto my legs, first striking my feet, then my ankles, knees. They saved my neck and back for last, the entire time berating me for my treasonous behavior. I don't know for how long I was in that room, getting my body worked over by skeleton people with bone clubs, but it felt like years. When my thrashing was complete, a cloaked attendant approached me as I lay, still writhing in pain. She uttered a few indecipherable words as she dripped what I presumed to be warm milk over my forehead and then said, Go forth, but walk nimbly, as a man no longer strong. We shall meet again at the time of the reckoning. And then I awoke, restrained in a hospital bed. The next several weeks were a blur of medications and doctor's appointments, but every now and then, Throughout my recovery, the images of the skeletal army and the bone kingdom flashed before my eyes. Once I was finally able to see and think clearly, everything that had happened when I had flatlined came flooding back. For the first six months of my recovery, I was confined to either a bed or a wheelchair. But now that I'm up and able to move as freely as I had been prior to the accident... The gravity of Mr. Skeletal's threat had become abundantly clear. Within the past two months alone, I lost my footing while descending my porch steps and shattered my ankle, jammed my wrist so hard that it fractured, and upon my return as a trainer at my jiu-jitsu academy, 
I performed a roll as part of a routine demonstration and broke two of my fingers. The doctors have no explanation other than bad luck as for why I've become so injury-prone, but I have no doubt. Mr. Skeletal was no hallucination, and his curse far more than a figment of my imagination. What I experienced was no dream. The Skeletal Army is real, and they are coming. I don't know when, but they are coming. If you've never broken a bone before, do your best to keep it that way and you might be safe. If you have, may the bovine gods have mercy on your soul. You are the weak and unworthy for whom Mr. Skeletal and his bone army hold such disdain. And they'll come for you too. Just as soon as they're finished with me. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs>